Reading is Magic Festival, 2nd to the 6th of October 2023. Brought to you by Bath Children's Literature Festival and our amazing festival partners from all over the world. Thanks to all the organisations who help make this festival happen. Hello there, I'm Cressida Cowell and I'm the author and the illustrator of the House of Train, Train Your Dragon books and the Wizards Once books and my new series, Which Way to Anywhere. I'm so glad you've joined me for the Reading is Magic Festival. All the events during the festival celebrate all the things you have the right to. Creativity, having a planet to read on, seeing yourselves in a book, reading for the joy of it, and getting brilliant advice about books from people whose job it is to do that. I hope you enjoy this event. Cressida Cowell says reading is magic and magic is for everyone. Hello, hello, it is Joel here, magician and TV presenter, and I'm welcoming you to the Reading is Magic Festival. I'm here in my lovely studio, atmospherically lit for you in a green leather jacket. I got brown curly hair and a big smile because I'm just so buzzing about this next event. Today we are celebrating 25 years of Skellywood author David Almond and we're going to explore the power of the imagination and the creation of this beautiful new edition of Skellywood which has been illustrated by artist Tom DeFreston. So let's welcome David and Tom who will get chatting to Janet Smith. Skellig with David Almond and Tom DeFreston, programmed by Birth Children's Literature Festival. Hello everybody and welcome to Reading is Magic. My name is Janet Smith and I am a white woman. I've got short brown hair. I'm wearing today my favourite bright orange t-shirt and I'm sitting on my sofa on the 27th floor of my apartment block in Toronto. And behind me, I have our Reading is Magic bunting, which is green and white. And I'm here today to talk with the writer, David Amond, and the artist, Tom DeFreston. David Amond is a writer of over 40 books, and those include novels, picture books, short stories, and he's also written plays and poems and songs and the words for an opera. His books have been translated into many, many different languages. Tom DeFreston is an artist, he's an illustrator, and he works in really interesting ways. And he's going to talk a little bit about this today. He works with paint, with film, with performance to make inc incredible constructed stories and narratives. And they're both here today to talk about this beautiful new edition of David Alman's novel, Skellig. Now this book was first published in 1998, so that's 25 years ago. And this is a 25th anniversary edition. And Tom has done the most amazing illustrations to go alongside David's story. Skellig, when it was first published, won the Whitbread Award, it won the Carnegie Medal, and it catapulted David as a writer into the forefront of being the, the person that we all go to to read books for young people, both in classrooms and at home and with families. Skellig has been made into a film, into a play and into an opera. So it's a story that's really captured the imaginations of all sorts of people to tell that story in all sorts of ways. And now it's told through both the words, but also through Tom's incredible illustrations. I think it's now time to say hello to David Almond and to Tom DeFreston. David, hello, how are you and where are you? Hello, I'm very well, thank you. Hello, Janet, hello, Tom. Uh, yeah, my name's David Almond, I'm a white man. <clears throat> I've written many books, including Skellig, which is 25 years old this year, astonishingly. I'm in my study in the northeast of England, quite close to the sea. The sea is just down the street. Um, there are lots of books and pictures around me and some puppets. I really like puppets. I'm wearing a flowery blue and white shirt. Um, I don't have a huge amount of hair. Behind me is a picture of me and my daughter Freya walking in the sea when she was two. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, Tom. Where are you? Hi, uh, yeah, I'm Tom. Um, I'm in my um, office um, in Oxford. 
Um, I'm a white uh, man. I'm 40. I've got a short kind of mousy hair, kind of a beard, slight beard. I'm wearing a shirt with, which is actually my pajama top, um, with tigers on it. And then behind me, I'm surrounded by blue bookshelves full of hundreds of books of paintings, art history, plays, poems, novels. Oh, fantastic. Uh, your office does look very lovely. I'm liking those bookshelves a lot. Um, so this 25th anniversary edition of Skellig, it's a very beautiful object as well as being a wonderful story. Um, David, it's 25 years since it was first published. What, as a writer, does that feel like for you? What's your remembering of writing it and your relationship with the, the story now? Yeah, I mean, it feels really weird. It feels weird that <laughs> anything existed 25 years ago sometimes. Um, and especially for this story, because this story kind of came out of the blue. I didn't plan to write it. I didn't plan to write a book for young people. But um, I was literally walking along the street one day and the story just began to tell itself in my mind. I didn't know what was happening in the story. I didn't know where it was going to go. I didn't know who the characters were. But I just knew that this story had this great kind of power for me. It was very weirdly, like, powerful sense that something was happening inside me and happening on the page. And I wrote it in a kind of very mysterious way. I never quite knew where it was going. I never knew what was going to happen next. Um, it just came with great force. Um, and here it is 25 years later. It was very strange that um, when I was writing, I didn't tell anybody about it. I didn't read, read it to anybody. I didn't show anything to anybody. It was very kind of, I just kept it very private. And then when it did come out, bang. <laughs> you know, it just had this massive effect all around the world, which was, of course, great for me. But yeah. I, I didn't know that would, I didn't know that would happen. <laughs> it certainly did. Uh, Tom, when did you first meet Skellig? In, in 1998, in, um, I read it uh, when I would have been 15. Um, and I think as so many readers were, I was just transfixed by it. And I've read it, I've read it many times since, actually. It's my, my wife is a, a novelist. It's possibly her favourite book. Um, so the, the pressure I felt when I was asked to do this, both for, to do justice to what David's written, but also <laughs> justice to what, uh, you know, many readers have loved about it. So, yeah, it's been in my head for, 25 years in many different ways. And David, you have worked very closely with illustrators on other books. So I'm wondering what that relationship feels like for you, because I know that you also make sketches and little doodles that have been included in, in some of your books as well. So that yeah. relationship that you have as a writer with illustrators, um, is it a close relationship or is it something that where you hand the book over and let them have free reign in their imaginings. I think it's really important, you know, as a writer, if you're going to work with a, a wonderful artist like Tom DeFreston, um, not to go to them and say, this is what I think <laughs> looks like, this is how I think this sheen, scene should look. If you're working with somebody who's who's a wonderful artist, you have to allow them the space to bring their own vision. And I think a good illustrated book is a share, sharing of visions. So, you know, my words are kind of recreated by Tom. And um, it becomes, I think Tom mentioned the word theatrical. And I think one of the great things about an illustrated book is it, it does become more theatrical. Here's a, you know, the unillustrated Skellig, even when it's not illustrated, a page, a pair of pages is like a stage itself because you've got the words, you've got the language, but within it, there are also the visions that the reader brings to it. And um, what's happened with this book is that Tom has actually brought his visions and put them on the page. Um, it's fantastic, yeah. And Tom, do you want to tell us a little bit about that process for you? Because when I was looking at the the new edition, I was very conscious of the way you had paced the illustrations and the story. So there are points where the images are very small and very delicate and a light light touch. And then there are others which are huge and dominant and very dark. And so I'm wondering how you kind of approach that that imagining but firstly it's so lovely hearing David talk about how he arrived at the story in the sense of mystery because I, I tried to replicate that in the process of making them so if David kind of 
found this story as he wrote it and that kind of mirrors michael's journey of you know uh, as the whole book begins of this sense of kind of wonder that gradually unpeels and so i wanted to make images in the process of making them that continued that so i had no idea i i never designed my work i had no idea what these images would look like when i set out um and that's why i purposely use things like i create stage sets i um put on performances so in this case get my get one of my um a niece and nephew involved get them to start acting out scenes um i then produce hundreds and hundreds of paintings and monoprints and drawings and it's it's an attempt i suppose to not illustrate david's words but the way that book kind of opens up the reader's imagination it's trying to not limit that imagination but expand it further so to almost enter the gaps of the book and to just let the things go wherever they go and to hopefully kind of expand the mystery of the book rather than restrict it so i, I never wanted to tie things down so here is skellig this is exactly what he looks like i always wanted things to be um I think as David said, kind of theatrical. You you kind you kind of want it's suitable that you know what this festival is called. That because reading is an act of magic, and I think there's few books that are as magical as this one. And I wanted to make a book that the reader it feels like a stage that they're entering and they are a participant in the action. And so you need to make images that allow that and allow room for growth and further imagination and wonder. And in the the story, um, David the. The young protagonist Michael, he's ten years old. He uh, he's he's going through quite a lot of stress in his life. His baby sister is very very unwell, and he's moved to this new house. Uh, and there's a tumble down garage, and in it he meets this strange creature. Can you tell us a little bit about the story and about how the story? Um, developed in, in your your mind and in particular this incredible character and being that is Skellig. Yeah, when I was writing it, um, you know, in, in many ways the story takes place in Michael's head. And when I was writing the story, I felt as if I was I was in Michael's head, I was Michael. And when Michael discovers Skellig for the first time, he goes into the garage and he goes through all these this darkness, passes all these things, these kind of very physical objects and you know, um lots of dust and dirt and um and I didn't know what he was going to find in there I had no idea but I just knew he was kind of he was going somewhere he was going to the back of this garage I knew he'd find something and when he finds him he shines the torch and he sees something there and then this thing says what do you want it was like he was saying to me what do you want what are you doing here <laughs> and um then Michael's called out of the garage like I was called out of the garage and Michael had to keep going back into the garage to find out what he'd found. And that's because I needed to keep going into the garage to find out what he's found. I didn't know what he was. And even, you know, and I say this and a lot of people think that can't be true, but mm -hmm. I didn't even know Skellig had wings until I wrote the sentence. Michael put his hand across his back and felt something there springy and flexible. And I thought, oh, my God, this guy's got wings. I really <laughs> didn't know until that moment. So it really was a process of discovery and um, a kind of very mysterious journey for me to go on. And I just had to steer with it and keep going on that journey. I didn't even know what Skellig was called until he says himself, my name is Skellig. I didn't know. That's I find that absolutely fascinating that this story is leading you, the creator of it. Um, it's, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Tom, can you... Talk a little bit about that idea of the wings and also, as David described, that the, the book is really set within the imagination of Michael, which as a as the artist must have given you so so much scope because there is, as as the other character in the story, Mina says, um, that this idea of truth and dreams are constantly getting muddled. Did that give you a sense of kind of playfulness and freedom to explore how these illustrations might manifest uh, completely and I, I think partly because for me the magic one of the magical things about the book is that you have this incredibly naturalistic real world setting there is no doubt of place time characters as believable and then within that world these things are happening that are you know both in Michael's head but actually within Skellig's 
um, you know, everything about Skellig and what he does and what he stands for, which feels kind of otherworldly or magical or not quite dream state, but um, beyond the possible um, or stretches the limits of it. And I knew that the images, I wasn't trying to create images that were a depiction of the real world. They're exactly what David's talking about, but I was trying to get inside Michael's head and could I make that unseen world seen? And suddenly that gives you permission to to make images which are hopefully really slippery, that you look at them in one way, but then when you spend longer looking at them, things start to emerge or appear from the shadows. So an image that might appear very dark and about one thing on closer inspection has has lightness or has wings pressed into the, you know, the walls or into the surface of the painting. So they're very, very obviously not real world images. And I wanted them to be, you know, it's a book that's full of such rich textures, like you can feel it in the words. And I wanted the images to feel like that. So I wanted them to feel dusky and murky and when it feels heavy to feel heavy and when it feels light and at the possibility of you know defying gravity I wanted that to happen as well um hence why they're these kind of layered up very textured work so you almost feel it as you look at them yeah that's that actually has made me um think about the juxtaposition within the the novel um David with the the baby being in hospital and obviously going through some very kind of state-of-the-art medical intervention but actually the world that Michael is living in and feels more solid and real to him is the world of his imagination and of nature and of evolution um, and I, I love that idea of the the kind of the technical medical world that's going on in the background with this incredibly natural world where things are still magical and unexplained um and were you were you I intentional in the writing that you didn't give us too much description of what's going on at the hospital with this little baby but you give us so much detail especially when Mina arrives of the natural world of dreams of imagination yeah and I think Mina was you know, again, was my guide into that. When Mina comes into the book, she puts her head up of the wall and says to Michael, are you the new boy here? And I felt as if she was saying that to me, are you the new boy here? And I felt as if I'd entered Mina's world. And Mina has this, you know, I think um, she, I wrote her, but it's almost like she pre-existed. But she has this amazing ability to be very precise and scientific about the world, like what she knows about evolution, what she knows about birds, what she thinks about education. So she's very kind of intelligent in that way. But in the same kind of group of sentences, she says, yes, that's of course, that's where your wings were. So she's able to contain a kind of very realistic world, but to see within that very realistic world, there are all kinds of possibilities. And... Um, and then when she starts to talk about the Archaeopteryx, which is, you know, the ancient dinosaur, the precursor of birds, um, this was all kind of revelation to me. And, uh, yeah, it was wonderful to to have Mina. Without Mina, the book wouldn't, the, the book would have been a sloppy, soft little thing. But she gives it a kind of intellectual rigor, as well as an ability to say, yes, of course there are wings there. Yes. <laughs> and Tom did the appearance of Mina and her love of birds and also her drawing of birds herself. Uh, what what did that feel like for you? Because obviously you're drawing birds within the book, but you also have to take on the character of how Mina would draw the birds. So we see her drawings of birds, plus we see your drawings of birds. And uh, how did that feel to play around with? One really lovely to be able to be playful and to to think, you know, I'm always trying to think how to draw like a, a child anyway, it's a way in. So it's like a, a really nice excuse to do that very literally. Um, I mean, I do think she's a, and I tried to bring some of this to the drawings, I do think she's this extraordinary character because for any, you know, any readers out there who will be the sim similar age to the two of them, and you might at school suddenly have people in certain subjects like making it feel as if the world, through science, through, you know, through certain things becomes more understandable and therefore less full of wonder when actually the, the opposite is true like as you get to find out more about medicine more about science more about the natural world like the deeper you go the more wonder and mystery and things that just seem beyond the possible are there and I think she brings I, I think what Mina brings and I wanted to bring into the imagery is like 
that closeness of attention like listen listen and then look and the things you will hear that that you may have otherwise just passed you by um so i i think she is attuned to the kind of the magic of the world but the magic that is actually present and uh one of the the things that um mina talks about and tells michael about is another writer um and artist called william blake um David, do you want to talk a little bit about the work of William Blake and its influence on, on you, but also the influence that it has on the character of Mina? Yeah, and when I realised that William William Blake was going to be in the book, I thought, of course he has to be. Blake has got to be in here, especially you know, his wonderful Songs of Innocence and Experience, which, um, which appear to be very simple very straightforward, but actually they're full of mystery, full of magic and uh, wonderful things that, and people keep trying to dispense with Blake and say, oh, go away, William Blake, but he remains with us. Um, he's this wonderful visionary, visionary artist. Um, so he was a big influence on me um, as a writer, as a reader when I was growing up and, um, and I began to feel something in Blake. And then I found this opportunity to use Blake in this book um, again, through Mina. Mina was the one who brings in William Blake, and uh, she has her motto: "How can a bird that is born for joy, born for joy, sit in a cage and sing?" And to me, that's a kind of central, um, a kind of central symbol of, of childhood, of what childhood should be like, and in fact, what she, we should all be like. We are all born for joy. Why should we sit in a cage? How can we sing if we're put inside a cage? And Mina is constantly looking for the places where the cages are. Let us break free of our cages. And um, and I think <laughs> I've been writing for a long time now. And I think more and more that that is central to my writing. What am I trying to do as a writer? I'm trying in some way to liberate people to be able to sing freely. And Tom, obviously, William Blake was also an artist and... Uh, also drew angels and creatures with wings. Was was were you conscious of that that art when you were creating these images? Completely, and I think it's interesting because I think speaking to so many readers who love this book and who read it, you know, when they were a lot younger, and you might imagine that Blake's a, a writer who's tricky, who's hard, who's and he is all of those things, but he's also completely accessible. And what I love about what David's done is he's not patronised his readers. Like eight, nine, 10, 11 year olds will read Blake and get it and will imagine into it and and actually feel a kind of an affinity. I mean, I certainly did at that age. I was I, I was into Blake. I was into Keats at a very young age as well. Like feel an affinity to his visions because they don't try and pin them down or fully understand them. They They're aware of how open they are to interpretation. Um, so, yeah, Blake felt like a guide in a way for this book. Like if I could take not to make images that remotely look like his, but take a bit of the spirit of his writing and his art and try and kind of feed that through the lifeblood of the the way I made the works. That felt that felt very important. And then more widely kind of romantic thinkers and poets were bubbling in my head as I made all of this stuff. I guess as well, um, William Blake's poem, Tiger, Tiger, is one of the first that a lot of young people in school might read or or even learn off by heart to recite. So that kind of connection, I think, is still very, uh, very relevant and, and vivid for a lot of young readers. Um, David, what for you is Skellig? <laughs> um, I mean, several times I've gone into places like in the classrooms and people sort of, Here's David Ormond, he'll tell us what Skellig is. <laughs> and I say, well, mm, actually, you know, you expect I should know because I wrote the book. But um, I don't. And in the end, they keep on saying to, to Skellig, what are you? Who are you? And in the end, he said, well, I'm something like a bird. I'm something like a beast. I'm something like an angel. I'm something like you. I'm something like that. And I think that's what he is. He's um, He's kind of indefinable. And to me... I'm he remains a mystery you know and as Tom said Tom said in his drawings he didn't try to pin down he didn't try to define exactly what Skellig looked like exactly what Michael and Mina looked like and I think that's really important you know and some people think oh is it enough to say he's mysterious but actually and often people say to me that Skellig he's weird isn't he and I say well but what about you aren't you weird aren't you just as weird in your own way and I think in the end Skellig is human 
is um, he can be angelic, he can be dirty and dusty. He's got all these things inside himself. And um, so he's kind of indefinable as the world is, as we are, as everything is. I think everything is quite mysterious as well as being very solid and very real. Yeah. And does that resonate with you, Tom? I've got, all I could think when just hearing David describe that there was funny coming back to Keats, so contemporary of Blake, who two things that came to mind, like one, he he describes a single negative capability, um, where he says is when a person is capable of being in mysteries, uncertainties and doubts without any irritable reaching after fact or reason. Yeah. And I think that's what Skellig makes us do, exist in that space. And at, at the end of those moments where Skellig is seen by other people, for instance, by Michael's mother, for instance, reminds me of the end of Ode to a Nightingale, where he says, um, Keith says, was that a vision or a waking dream? Fled mm -hmm. into music, do I wake or sleep? And I think the whole, yeah. every time you try and pin, you know, there'll be points in the book, certainly when I first read it, we get, this is what he is. And then he he troubles it and he becomes something a bit different. And, and I think readers, I think younger readers are far more relaxed about that than often adult readers might be where they they want that certainty um and i think that's the joy of the book that's kind of this beguiling creature of many possibilities i like that idea of beguiling um mm. david i know that uh people have asked you about uh sequels especially in the, the world of children's books we we really hope that there's going to be more stories of characters that we fall in love with but you you have made a kind of sequel to Skellig, which is Mina's own story. Um, and I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about why Mina and why she needed her own story. Yeah, so I wrote this book called My Name is Mina, and I wrote this 10 years after Skellig was published. And, um, and during that time, people would always come, will there be a, will there be a sequel? Will there be... What comes next? And um, but I couldn't write a sequel because, in order to write a sequel, I have to answer questions that I still don't know the answers to. Like, how does Skelly get into the garage? Where does he go at the end? What is he trying to pin him down? I thought, well, no, he has to remain. That book can't have a sequel. But then um, my American editor suggested, what about doing just a little piece to go into the. 10th anniversary edition, I think it was, just a little bit of something. I thought, okay, I'll write a bit of Mina's notebook. And as soon as I began to write a bit of Mina's notebook, I got a notebook and I began to show, and it was like Mina had been waiting inside my head all that time. So now it's my moment. And uh, this book, My Name is Mina, came out and it's all Mina's speculations and thoughts and dreams and her poems. And um, and for the time I was writing it, I felt like, I felt like Mina. I felt like I was Mina. So the print page says, you know, it's, this is what writers do, they just tell big lies because it says, my name is Mina. I mean, name's not Mina, my name's David Armour. <laughs> <laughs> when I began to write, uh, my name is Mina and I love the night, it just came out. And, uh, <laughs> so it was lovely to write, give Mina her, her, own, her own book. <laughs> and there's and, just uh, another one now, she's in a book called Paperboard. Yeah. Paperboard. Yeah, set in Japan. And uh, so, Tom, can we potentially look forward to uh, an anniversary edition of My Name is Mina with uh, <laughs> with your beautiful artwork? <laughs> that, that would be fun. It's a, it's a beautiful book. So, yeah, that would be lovely. <laughs> and there we are going to have to leave it. It's just been absolutely fascinating speaking to David Allen and Tom DeFreston about the wonderful 25th anniversary edition of Skellig. And I do suggest that you all get your hands upon it. Um, thank you so much. There is so much more Reading is Magic available on the website running all week. So do take time to take a look and to enjoy and to join me in giving a very lovely virtual thank you to David Almond and Tom de Freston. Thank you both so much. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Reading is Magic Festival, 2nd to the 6th of October 2023.
Oh, David, Tom and Janet, thank you so much for this incredible discussion. It was really interesting to hear how David didn't know what was going to happen in his book and find out how Tom created the stunning illustrations. Now, if you want to read this anniversary edition of the book, keep watching to find out where you can buy a copy or get one from your local library. And I'll see you again for another incredible Reading is Magic Festival event. You don't want to miss it. For more magical events happening live this week, visit readingismagicfestival.com. Inspired to read one of the festival books, visit the Reading is Magic Festival bookshop.org page, uk.bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash reading is magic festival. Check out Peter's special book bundles for schools, peters.co.uk forward slash reading is magic, or visit your local library. Calibre Audio lends free audiobooks to anyone with dyslexia, visual impairment, or any other condition that affects reading. To join or for more information, visit Calibre Audio. Grown-ups, please donate if you can. Visit www.readingismagicfestival.com forward slash donate. We'd love to know what you thought of this event. Email us info at bathfestivals.org.uk or tag us on social media at Reading is Magic Festival on Facebook and Instagram or Read Magic Fest on Twitter. Brought to you by Bath Children's Literature Festival and our amazing festival partners from all over the world. With thanks to all our sponsors, funders and supporters. Thank you to everyone who has worked on the Reading is Magic Festival. Festival, 2nd to the 6th of October 2023.